Morning! Here we are, Derry Ad Jetty. You might be saying, Scopes, where is the jetty? Well, the jetty is uh, underwater. There's the tables that we would sit on. They're, they're relatively dry. You could suppose you could sit on them. Uh, out there is the life thing. Now that's a seven foot tall pole. So yeah, that's a little bit covered. And let's just take a wee step back here and get back to normal focus. Here is the flotsam and jetsam that's been washed up on the shore. So yeah, let's see if we can catch anything today on a rather flooded locker. So here we are, Upper Loch Earn, another Sunday session. The last time I was out, I destroyed a GoPro camera. It went for a swim, so it's fucked. Just have to buy a new one of them. It's been an expensive winter, pike fishing. Replace the camera. Send the rods, I'm going to have to send the rod section back to uh, Dave Lum to get him to re-whip an eye on it because I busted the ceramic eye out of it. So, in postage alone that's 50 quid. Easy 50 quid. Maybe even more. 130 for a new camera. <laughs> don't tell my wife. Please don't tell my wife. But we're fishing, so that's the main thing. We're all good, we're out fishing. The lock is very, very high. I'm fishing at Derryad, and the jetty is submerged. With three rods in, I'm not putting four in today. I have a big floating brown trout on one, a roach, and an eel head. They're all edged hard in the bottom. The toe of the lock is hacking that way and the wind is going that way too, so you know, everything needs to be anchored down. I'm throwing five ounce leads. It's my standard ledgering setup. I was going to do, in fact I am going to do, I've been asked a, th a few times to do a series of videos about basic stuff, you know. The basic, how to set up a ledger rig, how to set up a float rig, how to make your own traces. So I am going to do that. I get asked that a lot. It's a fairly regular thing when people ask, can you show me how to make this, how to do this? And I always, you know, uh, help. But I always find if there's something you can watch, you'll learn a bit better by seeing how it's done. So that is in the pipeline. I am going to do that. It's just going to be basic short clips, you know, this is how you tie up a ledger rig. This is what a running rig is. Uh, it's not. I understand it's not going to be for everyone. There's going to be guys out there that are seasoned anglers and they're going to watch it and think, you know, this isn't for me. I already know this. But I, but I hope you kind of understand that it's not really for you. It's for the people that. I, it's not just youngsters. It isn't just young kids that's getting it's new to the sport. It's guys that have been. You know, maybe had a break from angling. It's guys that have been come to angling later in life. I always try. I do actually try to help people. I'd rather help people than abuse people. There, you go on some of the internet forums and it'll be, oh, you're a fucking naughty, this, that, and the other. Well, that doesn't help people. That doesn't encourage people, it just puts people off. Uh, you know, little things like an unhooking mat and a, like a pair of pliers to unhook fish. An unhooking mat you can buy off eBay for like 8 quid. Where I live that's not even 3 pints of lager. So, 8 pound. When I see people holding fish, 
I kind of un I don't understand the need to to hold the fish by the gills and then make it kind of fold it in half, kind of like hold it like that. I don't understand that, guys. You know, I, I, I don't get it. But again, each to their each to their own. So that's going to happen in the future. Uh, in other news, I went to the Ulster Angling Federation's uh, Loch Earn plan, Loch Earn management plan. That was interesting. That was uh, the some of it was very interesting. Some of it was very well researched. Other parts of it were, quite frankly, a joke. And I'm going to go into depth about what I what I that was, that was yesterday. I gave up a Saturday to go to a a meeting about the management of Loch Earn that was meant to have Edwin Putz there, who's the the minister in charge of Dira. That's the department that runs. That's the department that owns all the public angling estate. He didn't show up. You know the first speaker started good he did start good I'll give him that much he talked about uh, the the dams on the urn there's two of them they're both in the Republic of Ireland so they're out of the jurisdiction of anyone in Northern Ireland uh, let's discuss the dams for a minute in the 1950s after World War II the Republic of Ireland would have been classed as a developing nation what we would call today a third world country so they chose massive hydroelectric dams to give them their energy needs. They built, they built them on the Shannon and they built them on the Urn. Now, wasn't raised in the, the, the management meeting, but my understanding from the research I've done, the hydro dams on Bally Shannon at Bal and, Bal and at Balik were built on the proviso that there would be an adequate uh, fish pass to for migratory fish to move. The dams were built, and the government of the day went, we ain't building your fish pass. And in the 1970s, they used to overflow the dams so that the smolts would go over the dam instead of through the turbine. Let's discuss turbines. Turbines are exactly what they sound like. It's a big propeller that spins at thousands of RPMs a minute to generate hydroelectric power. Now, the only equivalent I can say to you is how this would work out. You get your normal kitchen blender and pick up a tomato. Drop the tomato into the blender and what happens to the tomato? The fishing hatchery that was on the urn that reared locker and brown trout I say locker and brown trout in uh, quotations because they weren't locker and brown trout the hatchery raised they took brood stock from Movanaher way up in the six mile water the experts stocked a strain of trout called Dolohan Dolohan goes straight to the bottom they don't eat flies they don't eat mayfly so for years and millions of pounds of taxpayers money the hatchery in Fermanagh was a complete waste of time. The experts tagged a, a selection and it was a pitiful selection of fish. They tagged 19 salmon, uh, salmon smolts, baby salmon, 19 and then they followed them through the system. The, first, the only there was only two of them that survived the first hydroelectric dam at Balik, and none of them, zero fish, survived the Balna the Ballyshannon dam. So no fish got to the sea. So no salmon can get over the dam. No fish can return back to the sea because they get turned to mince. And that seemed to be the main, the main drive, the main focus of the meeting yesterday. Uh, I was disappointed with the speaker who basically pushed to turn Loch Earn into a commercial perch fishery. This is insane thinking. 
You don't fix a problem by killing everything else. If you don't have the balls to address the problem, well then don't destroy the natural environment around it in the, in the desperate fucking vain hope of trying to fucking fix it. The trout guys are complaining that there's not enough trout. But what struck me yesterday about the meeting was the trout guys that turned up to it were all old men. They weren't young men, they were all old, old men. It's a generational thing where old men who will say to you, oh, back in my day, we done this, this and this. The urn system supported at one point 40 commercial anglers who removed tens of tons of pike, trout, eels annually from the urn system. Both sides, the lower and the upper. It was my understanding that the nets on the urn were grandfathered, the commercial fishing nets. So when the when the grandfather when the, when the man dies, no more netting. But they changed the rules last year, where they are seeking people to take up commercial nets. The expert, Dira expert couldn't answer exactly how many tons of fish were removed, couldn't answer the question about catchment reports. Uh, it was it was pie in the sky figures. From talking yesterday to some of the anglers that were at the meeting, they they joked that one of the, the men that was doing the commercial netting uh, was 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 illiterate. You know, so how's he meant to fill in paperwork saying how hey, many fish he caught? Same man bragged last year about not making enough money from the fish he was selling to cover his diesel bill for the year. Well, I'm sorry, gentlemen, if your uh, profession isn't providing enough money for you to pay your fuel bills, get a new profession. Times move on. Listening to some of the trout guys talk, they use the commercial netting of pike as a management tool to remove pike. And again, this is circular thinking. Let's try and help the trout by killing everything else. Doesn't work like that. The, the eels in our in our locks in the whole of Ireland, whole of the UK, the European eel is critically endangered. It's on the list of critically endangered animals. So we have dams that turn them into mints. They do piecemeal movement of eels where they'll trap like a couple thousand of them and move them up in a van and dump them in the lock. That's piecemeal. That is absolute joke. That's just a waste of taxpayers money so somebody can pat themselves on the back and do a big virtue signal going look how much I help the eels. Since the seven days the salmon fishing in the urn has died. There is no salmon. That's not the fault of the pike. That's the fault of hydroelectric dams. It's simple. If the fish can't get into the system or can't leave the system, then eventually there's not going to be fish. It did kind of, it kind of stuck in my throat, you know, listening to experts tell me that the place, the lock urn uh, is, is stuffed with big perch and it's the big perch's problem that there's no trout. The bad big perch. Now I know guys that I would class as some of the best anglers in the world that fish for perch. They can't catch these mythical fucking big perch. And they're the best anglers in the world. They specifically go to try and catch perch. They don't see them. So where's this trout guy getting this information? He let himself down a bagful. He really did. He started quoting figures from uh, gutter press rags. Now, thankfully, there was a, a group, a small group of pike anglers there yesterday. I have to emphasize the Ulster Angling Federation did not invite any pike angling clubs to speak. And I got the feeling that the Ulster Angling Federation 
would have been only too happy if no pike angling interest showed up at all. The trout guys want Lockern turned back to how it was in the 80s. They don't want match guys on their lock, they don't want pike guys on their lock. Sure they'll turn around in the same mealy mouth things like I fish for pike, I like the pike. Bullshit. You don't like a species by trying to eradicate it. The common complaint now on the the big the broad lock, the big lock, is that there is an overpopulation of jack pike. Well, what the fuck did you expect would happen if you take away the only thing that eats the jack pike? If you kill the big pike, there's nothing there to control the jack pike. And all the jack pike wants to do in its life is get to be a big pike, so it's not lunch. It doesn't want to be a fucking hors d'oeuvre. There was some speakers there. There was a, a scientist that turned up who studied Loch Erne for 30 years. His information that he spoke was, you know, it was very well spoke. But again, it didn't answer a lot of the questions. You know, it's, it's easy to go to a crowd of anglers and throw up charts that can't be understood or can't be read. It's okay to go to somewhere like a meeting and do a PowerPoint presentation where you're flashing through slides and no one can absorb the fucking information. You know, all you have at the end of the day is a scientist going, this is good, this is bad, this is good, this is bad. Prove it to the angler. Show us. Show us where it is good, show us where it is bad. Zipping through fucking 10 PowerPoint slides that click 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 doesn't show anglers anything. I do have a feeling that the Ulster Angling Federation has an agenda and coarse fish and pike are not welcome for this agenda. It is important that pike angling clubs, now I have the caveat yesterday, I went yesterday to this meeting as David Scobie. David Scobie, the guy that pays his fucking license every year and that fishes the urn every year. I fished this place since I was born. I'm what they call a stakeholder. I want to have this place so I can pass it on to my children so they can fish here. There was some little things like uh, the zebra mussel obviously impacted the fishing. We understand that. We know that. Uh, we know where the zebra mussels came from. They came in the bilge water of boats that came from the Europe and the UK. Uh, and then they spread throughout Ireland like wildfire because the, the experts in charge of the tourist industry said uh, screw the natural environment, let the boat people have their boats and go up and down the Shannon Urn waterway. So you had boats from the south of Ireland travelling to the north of Ireland and well it just spread the disease everywhere. There was a discussion about uh, anglers having to deal with uh, sewage. Now I found this, I found this hilarious that we're having a meeting about uh, raw sewage being dumped into the system in a place, in a hotel that dumped tons of raw sewage into the system while there was one of the biggest match angling festivals on the urn. Guys had to pack up and get out of the water because the water went from uh, normal visibility to shit. It went, literally there was floating lumps of turd that came out of a septic tank. The Northern Ireland and the Northern Ireland water, they dumped 20 tons, I think it was, of raw sewage into the River Urn. Now go to the River Urn in the summer and you're going to have uh, humans on jet skis, loads of boat traffic, people paddling and swimming. Would you swim in shit? Would you swim in raw sewage? I wouldn't. My kids wouldn't. Not that I loved, I wouldn't allow them to. 
So there we go. Dira go. Dira is the government. Northern Ireland Water is the government. So you have two government departments that don't seem to talk, don't seem to interact, and don't seem to address problems. They turned around and pronounced that three that that the, the, the fucking mighty sum of three million pounds was being given to Enniskillen to fix the sewers. This is three million pounds wouldn't cover the legal aspect to get anything done. That was confirmed by a guy who's a, an engineer who builds sewers for a living. You know, the sewerage system in Northern Ireland is a Victorian aged sewerage system. It needs massive amounts of infrastructure to fix it. But it just seems easier for them to kick it down the road and flood it into the system. The experts didn't address anything about the habitat destruction caused by uh, the artificial raising and lowering and levels of the lock. You know, you're guaranteed once the end of the boat, the cruiser boat tourist season, they drain water out of the lower lock and then the upper lock floods. While the upper lock floods, it floods Lots of lots of areas of water get flooded. The upper lock has to flow through the river to get to the lower lock. So the river then floods in a skillin. It then rips through in a skillin, destroying the weed, destroying any other habitat that the fish are there for. Because of the boat traffic and the, 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 the boat tourism, they've opened up areas of the lock where so boats can get in for some fucking bizarre reason. Those are spawning bays. So they trash the spawning bays. And then they're wondering why there's no fish turning up. They didn't address anything about the habitat for coarse fish or for pike. Uh, they, they talked about the trout. That's all they talked about. It's a difficult thing to listen to when you listen to experts talk like this. I don't... I don't understand how people can't... That to me, and this is maybe me, maybe I'm a bit fucking stupid here. Lock urns big enough for everybody. Trout have coexisted with pike and perch and roach and bream for fucking centuries. This myth that they, oh, the other one they came out with, Ulster Angling Federation. Pike are invasive, apparently. Have you ever heard such absolute balls in your life? And when challenged on this, or when challenged on that aspect of pike being invasive, the Ulster Angling Federation's response was to yell, shut your mouth at people that questioned this information. Shut your mouth. You know, I think trout guys have to understand the lock isn't just for them. And that's going to be the problem. You know, on top of zebra mussels and dams that turn everything to mints and water levels that fluctuate rapidly overnight. There's a million problems. But the trout anglers only seem to want to kill everything else in the vain hope that uh, that will make their fishing better. I don't understand that logic. You know, that's just me. Two hours later. I had a run. At least I think it's a run. I had a, I changed the bit to a big roach. And uh, as I wound down, I just I feel like the thump, 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 and then off. It actually felt like a trout. Pike is that you'll feel the jags, and it'll be deliberate, slow. Whereas trout, it's like it's like really, really, it's like hooking into electricity for a little bit. So this place will do big trout. I've had big trout from here before. Uh, just down past the bridge, there was a trout that appeared on one of the vlogs. 
I've seen one of the, well, one of my friends actually took fishing here. He had a, a six pound and an eight pound trout in the one day fishing for pike, throwing jerk bits. So you will get trout here. They're uh, just getting stuck into the whatever feed they can put into them. So I'm not sure if it was a pike or a trout, but I've had one run. I'm gonna have a break. I'm gonna have breakfast now. It is. It's just gone quarter past twelve, so I'm going to have something to eat. Have another cup of coffee. It's getting a little bit squirrely out here. But we're kind of sheltered here. The wind's kind of really hacking down this way behind me. But we're kind of sheltered here because of the trees and stuff here. So. It is time to uh, to do some cooking with scobes, I guess. It's nothing special, it's just breakfast slices, it's no steak and eggs like last week. Last week, when the, when the GoPro went tits up, when it went in for a swim, because I have this GoPro wired up with a microphone, the GoPro's not sealed, so water got into it and it destroyed it. When I downloaded the footage off the memory card, I was fit to see footage, but there was no sound, so whatever it did, it just erased the sound off the memory card. You know, shit happens. Last week was a bit of a brutal week, a brutal session even. Uh, I do have some videos on my mobile phone, I'm going to show you them now. Those clips were, the rain just, Jesus, it, you'd have been drier standing inside a shower. Really, really heavy rain. At one point we had to dig a trench to stop the rain that was coming off the fields from flooding out where we were sitting. But, different day, different location. The venue is flooded. Everywhere on the upper side is flooded. This is this was actually the fourth place I went today to try and find somewhere to fish. And what can you do, you know, everywhere is flooded. So, Let's do some cooking and let's get some uh, some hot food and another cup of coffee into us. And hopefully that the hopefully the pike will come after the hot food, eh? Cooking with scobes, breakfast slices and fried eggs for breakfast. Woohoo! Totally not healthy for you, but I'm hungry and need to eat. A bit breezy, a bit windy. Had breakfast. Breakfast slices, to be precise. For anyone that doesn't know what breakfast slices are, they're basically the odds and ends of uh, mystery meat. Could be pig, could be something else. We don't know. But it's good, tasty. Gotta love the tasty stuff. Getting some drizzle now. Wouldn't be Northern Ireland without fucking drizzle. Apparently the lock is rising uh, at 10, 10 millimeters an hour. So that would kind of coincide with what I'm what I'm experiencing here. Not much you can do about it, but I'm thinking I might change a bit. I'm thinking my wee roach might not be uh, cutting it, so I might whack out a mackerel tail or something like that there, just to kind of do something a bit different. But I give that roach another half hour, and then I'll have a, a mackerel tail to put out for it. I also want to talk it today. I know I've done a bit of talking, and you're about to be fucking sick of me talking. About the, uh, I'm not talking about the, the Anglin Federation's talk. 
you know, because the more I think about it, the more it gets what it, it would, some of the stuff that come out by was nonsense, and that nonsense would just irritate me. You know, the idea that they want to turn Loch Earn into a commercial perch fishery, because apparently Loch Earn's liggered with perch, and all you have to do to catch these big perch is just troll a wee bit faster. Experts, eh? But I also want to talk about uh, some drop about drop arms. I've been asked to talk about drop arms as well. Let me set this net down. Talk about the old drop arms. Cards on the table. Pete Foster, who owns Advanced Predator Products, has asked me to be a consultant for his his advanced predator products links now in the description below for uh, Pete's drop arms I'll show you the drop arms these drop arms you see me using these a lot these are Pete Foster advanced predator products drop arms now what I like about these drop arms is that this is a solid head it's one solid piece of plastic it's not something that's covered in foam that you can step on and destroy and the balls on the inside of it I'm not even sure if you guys can see the balls on the inside of it they're made of a, a, a plastic composite called Delrin Delrin is a super hard plastic composite it basically means they won't rust like steel balls do, like ball bearings do it means that in shit weather conditions like what we have, like where it's getting to get freezing, like not today obviously, they don't freeze, which is great, it means they don't freeze solid. So your drop arm should be able to work, you know, no matter what temperature you're fishing, obviously within reason. The drop arm is also attached to the back of them here, again I'm not sure if you can see that. This little bit in here, you can add counterweights to the back end of it to make the drop arm lighter. Now, that would work if you're fishing for something that's shy biting like an eel or a zander. Here, not really something I would need, you know. If anything, I would like the heavier, the drop arm head to be a wee bit heavier to pull the slack line out of out of the uh, from the broad tip to the bait. These are really these are actually quite heavy. You know, they will do the job, but when I've fished at longer range, you know, especially with braided lines, because you can't fish long range with mono, braided line, it kind of hangs in the water column, it takes a while for it to settle down and sink. So you want a heavy drop he drop arm to pull that slack out of the, out of the, the line. So when you cast out, or when you drop off of the bait boat, You'll find for the first maybe 20 minutes, the drop arm will go slowly, slowly, slowly down as it's pulling the slack out. That is just the way things are, that's drop arms for you. The only amendment or addition I have done to the drop arms that I got from Pete. Now again, I paid for these. I didn't get them given to me. You know, they were not free. I want to move this way because we're getting, we're getting some drizzle. The only amendment I've done is add these uh, little glow sticks to them. That's just so sort of efficient at night time that uh, you can kind of see where you're rot. You can see which one's up and which one's down. Now, I'm going to talk about other drop arms. Just give me two seconds. Over the years, I have had loads of drop arms. The very first set of drop arms I ever bought was the Fox ones. These ones. And as you can see, the head on them is a bit battered. These have been stepped on, stood on, and battered. But because this head is foam, it's very lightweight. So I had to add drilled bullets to do the same thing as like I was saying, pull the slack out of your line. 
help if you get a drop back bite. Now Fox and their infinite wisdom. Fox do this a lot by the way. These clips were actually pretty good. They could be tightened down. So you could have uh, like as slack as you want or as tight as you want. And they were plastic so they didn't freeze. Fox then upgraded them. To these. And these are made of a solid plastic. But the clip on them, you'll see the clip, something I've added to it. The clip was a, a plastic gate thing that you couldn't tighten. So any gust of wind it pulled the fucking thing out. Now it did have some advantages over the old foam ones. Being that you had a slot to stick a nightlight in. And that they were solid plastic. Now these uh, clips on here, these are from Solar. really good clips. The only issue I found with these was that, see, I don't know how you can describe this, there's a little lip between the bead and the metal and sometimes the line gets wrapped just under it and gets it snagged under it. So instead of the fish pulling the clip and the clip fall, the pulling the clip, the line of the clip and the drop arm falls, the fish is pulling getting solid resistance because it can't pull the drop arm out. So then, I got a second, I got another set of drop arms in my big fist of drop arms. And these were made by a company called RAD. Again, these I had to paint myself because they come in like white and they were near impossible to see in shit weather. So I painted the luminous orange. Now, and not, you're not going to be able to see in the middle of here, but in the middle there's two ball bearings. And those ball bearings have begun to oxidize and rust. So you'd put your line in there, and eventually you're, they just, they're not as smooth as you want them. Again, these were a step up from the Fox ones. They were better made, they were better quality. The Fox ones felt cheap and flimsy because they were mass produced in like Bongo Bongo Land or somewhere. These were produced, actually these were produced and designed by Pete, who then went on to make the ones that I use now. Uh, there's a bit of a falling out between that company, the RAD company, and Pete, and the RAD went bust. So these are just like a, an old drop arm that don't get used anymore. The drop arms I use are the ones that you see on the rod pods and the sticks behind me, the predator, advanced predator ones. Pete is bringing out a drop arm alarm that'll screw onto your, your bank stick and your rod will sit into it and when the drop arm falls it'll make a noise, you know, like an old school backbiter ghetto blaster alarm. Some I've shown my age here, some of the younger pike anglers are going to be going the fuck is that? But it is what it is. What I like about Advanced Predator products is taking something that was a bit a bit flimsy and a bit shoddy and a bit crap that you had to modify yourself or something that you had to fucking paint ten times to make it you make you see it. And they're making it a bit better. Instead of having something that's flimsy, they're making something that doesn't really uh doesn't feel cheap and crap. It doesn't fall apart. Those drop arms have been on those bank sticks and on my rod pod pretty continuously since I got them. I have, well, I don't beat my tackle with a hammer, but it's not baby, it's not cared for like an egg. I've had no problems with the drop arms that I'm using from Pete. Now, when he asked me to be a consultant, I took it as a bit of an honour to say, all right, okay. He then said, you're up there with some other anglers, you know, that are, you know, some of the best anglers in the world, best pike anglers in the world. And I kind of felt like a bit of a fraud. I kind of felt, fuck, I shouldn't be in amongst this crowd. I'm just a guy that talks shit on YouTube and does a bit of fishing and talking nonsense. 
So it was a bit of a surprise, a bit of a bit of a, a bit of a welcome, nice surprise to be asked if I wanted to be a, a consultant for some of his some of his gear. He has got some uh, some interesting stuff coming down the pipeline, and I look forward to showing it to you. But I think that roach needs to be uh, swapped out for something else. I'm thinking a mackerel tail, nice mackerel tail. So let me go and put these back in the van. I got a mackerel tail whacked out. I do believe the lock is rising a bit faster than I thought it was. Every now and then there's a big series of waves comes in and pushes the like the, the flotsam and jetsam crap kind of a little bit further up towards me. I had a half a friggin' tree come past me there a minute ago. Also, to the two crazy people that went up towards Chrome in a uh, blow-up dinghy, put the life jackets on, guys. It's crazy that people will go out in this weather without life jackets on. Absolute insanity. That's just a recipe for, well, taking yourself out of humanity. You know, there's easier ways to commit suicide, guys. Baitways, we have an eel popped up, eel head popped up. We have a half mackerel and a pollen on. Apart from the one run that I had today, that's about it, really. The more I think about it, the more I'm sure that that run was a trout. Simply because it was very jagged. What time's it now? Hold on. It's 20 to 4. A month ago it would have been getting dark by now, but we still have some daylight. I probably fished about half past 4. Then take a slow drive home. I kind of thought that there would be fish on the bank to show you, but what can I do, you know? I can only have the baits in, the fish have to cooperate. I can't believe people are in an inflatable boat in this weather. That's just insanity. With no life jackets. I realise the video this week has been a lot of talking. And no fish. Which is a bit shit. I blanked, by the way. In case it wasn't obvious. But there is good news. There is awesome news, actually. My wife has bought me a new computer. She's uh, managed to get me a new computer, so woohoo! So I'm going to pick it up from PC World today. So hopefully that'll mean that making these videos will be easier because the, the old computer, to make a video that was like 30 minutes long, it took literally all night for the movie maker thing to make it. And then it was like five hours for it to upload the friggin' YouTube. So hopefully with the new computer, it'll be easier to do I'm gonna look at getting a some software packages that make them make the vlogs easier for you guys to watch as well so we're improving the channel a little bit anyway guys thanks for watching sorry the video this week wasn't uh, wasn't you know, lots of fish on the bank, or any fish on the bank. You know, I only had that one run, and I swear it was a trout. 
you know, it's just just the way it was. I've been asked a few times from different people my final thoughts or my thoughts about the meeting with the Australian Federation, and I stand by what I've said in the video earlier on. Not all of the guys in the Ulster Angling Federation are bad guys. In fact, a very few of them are bad, bad humans, you know. But they do have an agenda. Uh, there's some men that are fishing for everything, and they're kind of okay. But there's guys that are, they, you know, they only care about game fishing. It's very obvious they only care about game fishing when they're still using outdated language like pike are invasive. You know, science has proved beyond a fucking doubt that pike have been in Ireland for as long as the trout have been. You know, the old myth by the uh, by those with green-tinted specks that pike were introduced to Ireland to uh, destroy the game fishing by the English. Yes, I hear that. I hear that a lot. Go to the Western Locks, go to Corbin Mask, and you ask some of the knuckle-draggers for their take, and there'll be five minutes because they have to go and sign out the, uh, the brain cell that they all use. And then they'll come back and say that pike were introduced to Ireland by the English to destroy the game angling. Because the English are to blame for everything that went wrong in Ireland. Apparently. And I'm not getting into that. Not getting into that nonsense. So thanks for watching. Uh, let's see what this new computer does. And hopefully the next vlog has some fish. I'm actually going out on an overnighter. The, in the next vlog I'll be actually out overnight with Mr. H. So I'm doing a Saturday and Sunday session which is tomorrow and the day after. It's been a full week. It's taken me a full week to make a video. You know, to try to upload it, and trying to get stuff off a of GoPro and... You know, the PC that I have at the minute is from 2012. I bought it when I came home from England, or Scotland even. Um, it's gone. It's just past its date. You know, the hard drive's about fucked. To the point where if I'm doing like a webcam stuff, there is no sync between voice and speech, so it's just shit. So hopefully this new thing, it has a, it's, been, it's pretty good apparently, it's got a Verizon or a Verizon or something sort of fucking motherboard or hard drive, which is meant to be really good, so. I'm not really that into the technology, I basically went on to some people that I said, uh, this is the budget, send me a place to buy a computer for that budget, and they come back and they says, this one on PC World's pretty good for that price, you get loads of extras, uh, blah blah blah, so that's what we went for. But my awesome wife has uh, surprised me with an early birthday present. It's my birthday in March, so... Thank you, wife. Anyway, until the next time, chaps. Tidelines. lines.